church, whether you are here in person, whether you are listening on the radio, or whether you are watching the streaming online. We're glad you could be with us today. And our theme today is salvation. I don't know about you, but I grew up hearing Jesus saves. It was kind of a motto of the church. Well, what are we saved from? And what are we saved to? And who can be saved? There's all kinds of questions about that that we're going to explore today. Um, But if you would just bow your heads with me, we're going to start with just a word of prayer, welcoming our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you promised to be present where even two or three were gathered in your name. We thank you, God, that you are the head of this church. I'm not the head. This congregation isn't the head. The council isn't the head, but you're the head of your church, and we are your body, and we want to represent you well, and we want to bring honor and glory to you when we gather in your name. And we welcome you, Lord. We welcome your spirit here amongst us. Have your way today. Challenge us, inspire us, encourage us. Lord, whatever we need individually, the needs that we come in with this morning, some are are carrying heavy loads, and we ask you to lift those loads and make them lighter for your burden is light and we ask all these things in your precious name in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen so stand up and let's find who we're worshiping with this morning greet one another and uh, then we'll go into a time of worship This is a new song we're going to teach you guys today. That was the chorus. We sang the chorus twice. We're going to start again. We're going to start with the chorus, and then we're going to fall right into it. So just watch the words on the screen. Here we go. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation, and it's beautiful. I've got a heart Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Oh, can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Oh, once you choose it, you can lose it. Cause there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy I've got an old church choir singing in my soul I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful I've got a heart overflowing cause I've been restored There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy In the valleys that I wander Turn to mountains that I can climb Oh, you are with me You never leave me Cause there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing Gonna steal my joy I've got an old church choir singing in my soul I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful I've got a heart overflowing Cause it's been restored There ain't nothing gonna steal my Now we get to learn the bridge, and it's real easy. So we're just going to put it up on the screen, and we're going to roll with it. Here we go. 
Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat. Cause it's all you'll ever need, all you'll ever need. Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat. Cause he's all you'll ever need, all you'll ever need. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful.
till you give yourself away. All the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Through the sun sets free, oh, is free.
Thank you, Father. That's the truth that you, we are who you say we are. We're not what the world says we are. We're not what our enemies say we are. We're not sometimes who we feel we are inside, but we're what you say. We belong to you, Lord. We're chosen. We're adopted. We've become your children, and it's by your grace that we have been saved. Thank you for that, Lord. We are so grateful, and we bless you and honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, it, <coughs> excuse me, it was a busy week for us this week, and before I dismiss the children, I want to show you a little bit of what we were doing this week on Wednesday night. So I'm going to have Jerry put up uh, some pictures here. This is uh, the way that uh, Beth and, and Jolene had laid out all the uh, things that were going to go in those gift bags for the teachers. There was uh, quite a number of items there. I know you can't see them all. And then we got the children who came on Wednesday. There was about 20 kids who came, and we had about 12 adults who just went down the line for about... 45 minutes or an hour I forget how long it took us but it was a lot of fun just filling the gift bags this is the whole gathering here that's the whole crew and I like that young man's excitement on the in the red shirt there in the front he was th he was thrilled to do it and uh, we've got uh, the three district schools here in Whitefish plus the Christian Academy that tomorrow all those uh, little gift bags and the blessing cards are going to go out to say we appreciate you we appreciate what you do for our kids and um, that's going to be we, we trust not just um, a blessing but also the realization we want it to communicate that there's a God who loves them and there's a church who cares about our community so that's going to be um, that's going to be a delight to do that I don't know who gets to deliver them but I it it sounds like fun to me to go around and give gift bags to all the workers in our schools and in our community. So that's going to be happening tomorrow. Uh, just to mention these uh, Child Bridge um, collection boxes, to this Sunday, today, is really the last Sunday you could fill one of these. They will be coming sometime during this week to collect those so if you want to give to that ministry that helps families who are adopting or who are fostering children then um, do it today or bring it in the office tomorrow and we'll make sure that all that gets to the place where it's needed um, there's other things to, uh, that are happening you'll see those in our bulletin but just to mention um, Don Hansen has purchased some pickleball Equipment and wants to get some games going using our uh, gymnasium. So uh, if you're interested in playing pickleball, it's kind of a, a dumbed-down version of tennis that doesn't require quite so much energy. I don't know if the pickleball enthusiasts will appreciate me saying that, but that's kind of what it is. You have a net, and, um, and it's kind of fun. And, and Don wants to organize some games with that so his details his information is in there you can get a hold of him this week if you would like to have a go at that and see how much fun it is so I think that's probably all that I want to mention um, in this service so if you turn your attention to the screen we'll have our little promo intro for the message today following on our theme just covering some of the basics of our faith what is the church what is last week we were talking about what is temptation and having talked about that we almost uh, it's required to go on and talk about what's the solution which is salvation and that's what we're going to be talking about today what is salvation I want to take you back oh 
we'll do the readings in a moment, but I want to take you back 1900 years to um, Italy, to the Roman Empire in the first century, and back to a city called Pompeii. It's August of AD 79, and it's called August because in that month, the Roman citizens celebrated one of their famous emperors, Augustus, and so the month came to be called August. And on the 23rd of August, they had a festival, a feast called Vulcanalia, and that was in honor of the god Vulcan, who was the god of fire. It's the word from which we get our English word, volcanoes. And behind the city of Pompeii was a volcano. It was called Vesuvius. I'll have Jerry put a picture of it. There it is. And there's the population gathered between the uh, Tyrrhenian Sea and the volcano Vesuvius. It had been rumbling, and in fact, it rumbled quite a bit on the 23rd, which a lot of people thought was kind of an auspicious sign that the god of fire was being honored on that special day. The city of Pompeii was a little bit like Las Vegas for us. It was the, it was the party town. People, a lot of the rich had second homes in Pompeii. And people used to go there to live it up and to enjoy themselves and to indulge themselves um, with feasts and, and often with illicit sexual relationships. Some of their uh, concubines and mistresses lived there and they would um, go from wherever their homes were to have these affairs in Pompeii. It was, a, it was Sin City. And on the 23rd, of August as people celebrated, as people had street events and parades, nobody knew that within 48 hours, every single resident of that city and some of the little neighboring villages around like Herculaneum would be toast, literally incinerated to death and buried under several feet of ash. Here's some pictures after the archaeologists began to explore, the one on the left are the remains of some of the women, men, and children that were simply burned to death. And there in the lower right is a picture of Herculaneum, a little seaside village between um, Napoli and, and Pompeii where people were sheltering and simply um, burned to death. 1,100 to 1,200 degree gases came out of that volcano and literally just fried everything and then the top blew and the volcanic ash buried the city and virtually obliterated that whole area. And nobody realized it. Was, well, a few people did. A few people actually got worried about all the rumbling in the ground and left and went to safety, but the vast majority of people were too busy playing and having fun to realize the danger that was coming and the disaster that was coming. It's interesting, still today, the estimates are there are three million people living in the vicinity of that volcano if it did what it did in 79 AD, three million people would be significantly affected by another eruption of, Vulc of, of Vesuvius. Somebody said, if we don't learn the lessons of history, we're doomed to meet, to repeat the mistakes. Well, we're going to read some scripture this morning Gene, are you our reader this morning? That's excellent. And the first scripture is going to be out of Psalms 27. And I'm just going to ask Jean to read the first five verses. And then those scriptures were last week's um, What is Temptation and, and Sin is the wrong slide there, Jerry. We're talking about salvation today. And then the second reading is going to be from Mark chapter 10, a longer reading. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, 
It is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though a war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord is only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe from his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and will set me high upon a rock. Please rise for the gospel. <clears throat> Today's gospel reading is Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 21. As Jesus started on, a way, on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except for God alone. Do you know the commandments? You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at, looked at him and loved him. One thing I, you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. You may be seated. The disciples were amazed because Jesus said in response to that um, encounter with that rich man, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples' response was, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? Their concept of being rich was that you were blessed by God. You must have a special relationship with God if he had enabled you to become wealthy. And if the wealthy, those who have a special relationship with God can't be saved, or at least it's difficult, then who can be saved? Because Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Who can be saved? We're going to talk this morning and really about four questions. What do we need to be saved from? What are we saved to? Who can be saved? And how can we be saved? Jesus' response to the disciples asking who then can be saved was this. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So whatever this salvation thing is, we can't do it. I came up with a definition for salvation and I came up with this as a statement. Salvation is a spiritual transformation which rescues us from a deadly danger. It's a spiritual transformation and we can't do that. Doesn't matter how hard we try, it doesn't matter how successful we are in life, it doesn't matter whether we're rich or poor, whether we're educated or uneducated, it's not something we can do. It is a divine activity of God, action of God that spiritually transforms us and it rescues us from the dangers that lie ahead. It is supernatural. Some people have a problem with God being supernatural. They want a God that they can figure out. They want a God that they can control. They want a God that somehow is, is graspable in their imaginations. But if we don't have a God who is beyond the natural, who is supernatural, then we're in big trouble. Because some of the things that need to happen to us, particularly this one, are beyond man's ability with all his cleverness and wisdom and success and wealth. It is a supernatural transaction. It's not only 
well, Jesus didn't say it's difficult. He said it's impossible. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. And it's really hard even for us human beings to describe it. The Bible uses all kinds of descriptions. It talks about being born again. It talks about being adopted. It talks about us being reconciled to God. It talks about us following the way. The Bible talks about us being Christians. It talks about us, as that song did this morning, being children of God. It talks about us going from slavery to sonship, from darkness to light, and from death to to life and all of these descriptions don't fully explain that spiritual transformation that happens they're just attempts for us to grasp it in our minds to understand it for some people that moment in their lives is a dramatic conversion and for others it's just a very ordinary kind of obvious thing to happen for me it was fairly dramatic I remember and will for the rest of my life the night when I surrendered my life to Christ. And you may not understand this, I don't understand it, but I'm telling you the truth. Jesus came into my room that night and I knew he was there though I couldn't see him. And I knew what he was saying to me though I didn't hear his voice. And I know he was saying to me, Paul, will you give your life to me? And I said to him, tell me what you want to do with it and I'll decide whether I want to give my life to you. (laughs) The arrogance of a 19-year-old. And many times I've said, God, forgive me. And God wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't answer my question because he wanted me to answer his question. Will you surrender your life to me? And I agonized for hours over that decision and he wore me down until I said, fine, I don't care what you do with my life, I'll give it to you. And I fell instantly asleep. I'd been tossing and turning for hours. And when I woke up the next morning, I felt different. And I got dressed and took a shower and stepped out of my room. I was at university and a friend of mine was walking past and he said, Paul what happened to you and I thought he was talking about something that had happened the previous day and I started to answer that question he said no I'm not talking about what happened yesterday you look different this morning and that was a confirmation to me because I felt different in fact the world looked different when I looked out of the window something was different about it it was a dramatic, but other people have had, and there's no, there's no right or wrong here. God takes us where we're at, and he does things in our lives that does a transformation. Whether there's lights and, and words from heaven, or whether it's just a simple decision that we make, we become different. I'm going to ask Angelita to come up and share just a couple of minutes about her story, very different to mine. Sometimes people talk about asking Jesus into their hearts. Sometimes they talk about choosing to believe. Sometimes they talk about repenting of their sin or beginning a new life in Christ. It doesn't matter what words you use. It's this spiritual transformation. Tell us how it happened for you, Angelita. I was very young. I was... um an unwanted child, very unloved, sadly. (laughs) And um, we were in my grandmother's house. She adored me. My parents didn't want to hear me or see me, but Mumu, my grandma, adored me. And I followed her like a little lapdog, and she always had time for me. And she would tell me how much she loved me. It was the first time I heard it. She would tell me how much God loved me, which I just thought it was amazing because I felt such a bad little girl. And I clearly remember the moment when she sat in her library. They had this beautiful library, rocking chair, and it was the time when she just cuddled us. And uh, she said, you know, Alita, God loves you very much. 
and I trusted her. I just believed what she said because she loved me. And then she pulled a Bible from the bookshelf and showed me a picture. It was a line drawing of a man hanging on a cross. And she went on to say, and he died for your sins. Do you believe that? Well, I was just so relieved because I knew that I was a little sinner. I was less than three years old. Time went on. I met Paul, we went to Bible college. I was a young adult and I'd forgotten that moment. And all I could think was, I've been a Christian all my life. I can't remember when I wasn't a believer, but it bothered me because one of our lecturers in Bible college was always pressing us to have an answer if someone asked, when was the moment you gave your heart to God? And then the second question he always asked was, and what did God do for you today? Well, I was kept very quiet for the first question because I didn't want to say, oh, excuse me, I've known God all my life. You know, it didn't seem right. <laughs> so I kept really quiet, but I would answer the second question. So I was never flagged as a difficult student. But I kept saying to God, please, please, show me that moment when I gave my heart to you because I, I just can't remember. And it was years later, we married, our boys were born, we'd lived in LA, we came back to England, and one day God just said to me, do you remember Moomore? And I said, yes. And then all the memory of that very moment in the library, sitting on her lap in the rocking chair saying, yes, I believe, came flooding back. So I remembered. Thank you, Angelita. We're all different. We all have a story, though, to tell of how God got a hold of our lives at some point, or perhaps at many points. We are all engaged in a deadly pursuit, all of us here this morning. This pursuit has a 100% mortality rate. It's called life. Nobody gets out of here alive. There's only two things certain in life, right? Death and taxes, and April 15th's coming up, so you better be aware of that deadline. But we all have to face death. We're engaged in a process that's going to end in death. Those people in Pompeii did not know their end was coming. And so many in our world are oblivious of the dangers. Jesus was talking with his disciples one time and they asked about some people who've been slaughtered by Pilate and Jesus responded by talking about an incident that had happened in Jerusalem. He said, those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on, on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish that's a pretty strong cautionary word to us this morning Jesus saw deadly danger ahead that other people were oblivious to so what are we saved from I asked a whole bunch of people that question what are we saved from and here's some of the answers they came up with slavery to addictions being controlled by our sin, spending eternity without God, damnation, guilt, and shame, saved from the absence of love, the consequences of our sins, hell, torment, the worst inclinations of our natures, worshiping wrong things and evil. That's a good list of stuff that we're saved from. We need to know the dangers that we're being rescued from. The theologians say that there are three enemies to our souls one of them is the world we live in it's always trying to shape us shape our thinking get us to act and behave like it thinks people should that's one enemy the other enemy is in here it's our old nature we talked about those temptations of pride and, and uh, selfishness and lust and, and envy and all those other things that we battle inside. That's an enemy. 
that's wanting to destroy us and then of course the third enemy is the devil himself and he's convinced a lot of people that he doesn't exist those are some of the things that we're saved from I've asked Jean to share a little bit of his story because Jean is an interesting guy and he could talk for about a half an hour and I'm going to try and control him to three minutes I don't know if that's possible but Jean Tell us, you were brought up in a Mormon family, right? A good Mormon family. Yes, and you I believed the things. Pick us up there and talk to us a little bit about how God got a hold of you. And well, I try to promise it won't be the everlasting gospel. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that. I was raised a young Mormon boy. Grew up in a very strong Mormon family. Uh, I did everything that I was supposed to do as a young boy growing up. And then I was put into a position where my father died when I was just going about 12, 13 years old. My mother remarried a couple years later and moved to California. And I refused to go and said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be on my own. And at that point, I, I didn't really step away from Mormonism. I was always a Mormon boy and Mormon in my heart. But I was a young teenager that didn't have a lot of guidance. And uh, I lived with friends and family. I was really into athletics. And that's what really encouraged me along my my road went one direction I thought this is where God has taken me I, you know I played whatever sport was at the time I played that's what I did I was uh, you know that's what I did I was an athlete and uh, athletics got kind of taken away from me too and I'm just like where am I going right now I had been playing football at a major division college and got got injured and uh, said okay a new direction I'm going to go here and I went back with my old high school football coach one day said hey I tell you what I got a job for you I was so I'm going to go back and make my mother happy and go on my mission for the Mormon church I was waiting to go on my mission I had got all serious and ready to go as a young Mormon boy trying to put my crazy athletic past behind me with a lot of the mischief that I you can imagine an unguided teenager got into and I did most of that but uh, my high school football coach said, I, I got a job for you, and that'd be teaching shop and, and PE and starting a basketball program, a football program for the Little League in Jackson Hole where I grew up. I thought, you know, I could do this. So we went out and did it. But I was driving a school bus that had a wood shop in it, and I would drive to all the outlying districts and teach wood shop to kindergartners through sixth graders and help coach that went along for a certain period of time and uh, the first school I went to the Wilson School there was a new school marm that showed up there uh, and it happened to be a gal by the name of Jeannie Ransdell and I thought hmm she would make my great Mormon wife <laughs> unfortunately she uh, had been trained. God had raised her up ahead of time and set her aside. And she started about the same time I did in my walk away from Mormonism. And I'll get to this in just a second. But it turned out that uh, I went out to convert her into Mormonism. And the only way I could do it was to get into God's Word because she was firmly seated in God's Word. And she knew God's Word. And the more I got into it, the more questions I had about Mormonism. And the things you have to do, the boxes you have to check off in Mormonism to get your ultimate reward. And I didn't see any of that in the Bible. And I said, well, maybe that's, that's it. And so one day in a dentist chair, the dentist, there was a, I started going to church with Jeannie and uh, Gretchen. A lot of you know Gretchen at the church where she was at as a young married couple. And we were, we were plugging away. And I had a dentist appointment and it was another, it was a, a Catholic spirit-filled Christian dentist that had my mouth wide open and he was working on a crown and he just started preaching to me about the love of Jesus and how much God loved me and that I needed to surrender my life to Christ and you know I'm in a position where I can't talk back or argue and so the next thing you know I'm 
praying the sinner's prayer with him, and the dentist chair, ah, 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 ah. Gene, I'm going to stop you there. This is a great story, and we want to hear the rest. There's a lot more interesting bits I've heard, but I'd like to preach a little more this morning. Okay, let me do the one, one last thing. Okay, I'm, I'm, pre- I'm saved, but it was years later, and just Angelina just brought it up. It was years later that I remembered after accepting Christ, and we'll share more about my story later, but I remembered a time I was nine years old. My mother was away. My father was away. They were out to dinner. I was babysitting my two younger brothers. I was waiting for my favorite TV program to come on, Bewitched. And it got preempted by this Billy Graham crusade. My mother had told me Billy Graham was a good guy. And you can said, so, okay, so I got on my knees and I didn't know I was doing anything wrong for Mormonism because mom, mom said he was a good Christian man. Mormons believe they're good Christian people. They just don't have the relationship in here. So I kneeled and prayed the sinner's prayer back when I was nine years old. And I remembered that. And Angelita just brought that up. It's like, okay, I sincerely ask Jesus into my heart and God honored that. Just say, cool. God loved it. Excellent. Thank you. I love hearing stories of how people came to faith and how Jesus did different things in their life at school. But let's ask another question. What are we saved to? What are we saved for? Jesus said in John 10 verse 10, I have come that they, that's us believers, may have life and have it to the full. And again, I asked a bunch of people, What do you think you're saved to? Or what are we saved for? And they came up with these things. Eternal life, a new family, a faith community, a new way of thinking, God's plan for your life, a relationship with God. Those are all the things we know what we've been saved from. Now what are we saved to or for? All these things are good things, but is that all that we're saved for and to? There was a a young man in London in the late 1800s. His name was William Booth. And one day God gave him a vision. I'm going to read very long. I'm going to just read some bits of it. But I want you to hear what God showed him. He said, I saw a dark and stormy ocean. Over it, the black clouds hung heavily and through them every now and then vivid lightning flashed and loud thunder rolled. And in that ocean, I thought I saw myriads of poor human beings plunging and floating, shouting and shrieking, cursing and struggling and drowning. And I saw out of this dark, angry ocean, a mighty rock rose up with its summit towering high above the clouds. And all around the base of this rock, I saw a vast platform. And onto this platform, I saw with delight that a number of the poor, struggling, drowning wretches continually were climbing out of the angry ocean. And a few of those who were already safe on the platform were helping the poor creatures still in the angry waters to reach the place of safety. Here and there, some had actually jumped into the water regardless of the consequences in their passion to rescue the perishing. And I hardly knew which gladdened me more, the sight of the poor drowning people climbing on the rocks or the self-sacrifice of those whose whole being was wrapped up in the effort for their deliverance. But what puzzled me most was the fact that though all of them had at time, one time or another been rescued from the ocean, nearly everyone seemed to have forgotten all about it. It seemed as if the memory of the darkness and danger no longer troubled them. And what seemed equally strange and perplexing to me was that these people did not have, seem to have any care about the poor perishing ones struggling and drowning right in front of them many of whom were their own husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, and even their own children. Now this astonishing unconcern could not have been the result of ignorance because they lived right there in full sight of it all and even talked about it sometimes. Many even went regularly to hear lectures and sermons in which the awful state of these poor drowning creatures was described. And then I saw something that was even more strange than anything that had gone before in my vision. I saw that some of these people, already safe on the platform, 
I saw that two some of these people already safe on the platform, a wonderful being was calling, wanting them to come and help him in his difficult task of saving these perishing creatures. And yet they were always praying and crying out to him to come to them. Some wanted him to come and stay and spend his time and strength in making them happy. Others wanted him to come and take away various doubts and misgivings they had. Some wanted him to come and make them feel more secure on the rock, so secure that they would be quite sure that they would never slip off again into the ocean. Because as a matter of fact, it's well known that some had walked so carelessly and had lost their footing and fallen back into the stormy waters. Do you get the point? William Booth in 1865 started what we call the Salvation Army. He wanted to have the church wake up to the disaster that was in front of them and for people who'd be willing to step out and rescue others from the danger that we're in. The physical problems and crises they were facing, but more than that, the spiritual crisis and problems that people were facing. And so he founded the Salvation Army. It's still going on today. It's still doing good work. What are we saved to? Well, we're saved to eternal life and a new family and a new way of thinking and God's plan and a relationship with God. But surely we're saved for a task, a purpose, a ministry, an enormous vision. Because just like William Booth, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. The disciples asked Jesus a question. Who then can be saved? And Jesus said it's impossible with man. It takes a miracle. But God's in the miracle business. We've heard some stories this morning of miraculous events and coincidences and encounters that turn people's lives around. Who can be saved? Everyone can be saved. Acts 2.21, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow keeping his promises. He's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It's not Jesus' heart for anyone to be lost. He died for the sins of the whole world. Well, how are we saved? If it's a supernatural transformation, do we have anything to do with it? Does God do everything? Jesus' own words to the disciples in Luke 13, unless you repent you will all perish. Yeah, there's something we have to do. And the first step is right there. We have to repent. That word in the Greek text of the New Testament is metanoia, and it means a change of thinking. You need your mind renewed. In the Old Testament, it's a different Hebrew word is Teshuva, which is a change of direction. You're walking away from God, you have to turn and start walking towards God. We have to do some changes in our thinking. We have to change from thinking we can just do fine, thank you very much, we don't need God, to recognizing we need a Savior. Recognizing there's some dangers ahead that unless we do something about it, we're going to be lost. We're going to perish. We're going to spend an eternity without him. I want Amber to come up and share a little bit of her story. Where is she? Thanks, Amber. We need to recognize we need a savior. Tell us a little bit about how it happened with you, Amber. Thank you. Amber Countryman here. Get a little nervous if I'm not singing. So I wrote a few things down just to make sure I stay on uh, track here. Um, to answer your question about um, why we're saved, how we're saved, right? Is that how you posed that? Yep. Um, I believe it's for a kingdom purpose. And um, 
Just like in the song that I sang, Reckless Love, before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. So before I even came into existence, God had a plan for me. He had a kingdom purpose for me. Um, that was a little hard to see from, for a good half or more of my life because I was born out of wedlock and I was a very unwanted child um, from my father. So he rejected me. So that was a very poor image of what a father is. And unfortunately, my thought of what Jesus was to me also, just rejected by him. Um, I grew up in a mildly Christian household, fell away during my teen years. And at 27, I found myself coming out of a nine-year marriage with two babies on my hips. Surely lots of extras. Again, the devil told me the story of that I'm unwanted. But my story doesn't end there. It was just beginning. Um, thanks to God's renewing mercies, he left the 99 for me. I believe that you come to the faith each day. I think it's a constant renewal of awareness of a need for and a desire for relationship with Christ. Um, I then became close with God, but only because I started giving thanks in all circumstances. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.18. That's actually my daughter's life verse. <laughs> That's pretty special. Um, but I believe that it was at that point that I realized that I had a kingdom purpose, and thanks to that Bible verse. Um, because it changed my thoughts, changed my mind, and changed my hearts about who I was and what God thought of me. Um, God supports me because I have a kingdom purpose. Relationships are paramount, guys. During this time of coming out of that divorce, I, I needed relationships. Um, there was a Bible study teacher, uh, Vicki Kramer, that I've been with now for 13 years, and she came alongside me, along with multiple other wise people, encouraging me, loving me, being physical, right there in the trenches with me. Um, I can say that that's really what brought me to the place that I'm currently at. I'm not only wanted and loved through God, but I'm also now um, loved and redeemed um, in my circumstances, and um, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. The first step is repenting, acknowledging that we can't do it without God. Coming to that realization, we need a savior, and we're gonna lose our radio audience in a minute or two, so I just wanna say to any who will be leaving us shortly that if you've never come to that place in your life, our prayer is that you would come to realize that there is deadly danger ahead for every one of us, but you have a savior who loved you so much that he died that all of us need not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16 and 17 says it better than any other way of saying it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. God's got a rescue plan and his rescue plan has a name. It's Jesus. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Repent, believe, and finally declare Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen? Amen. Let's have the worship team come back as we stand and say together this declaration of truth we call the Apostles' Creed. This is what we believe. Let's stand together and say that. Jerry, you'll put up the words for us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's have our worship team help us to declare that in song this morning as we sing our way out of our service. Go for it. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Back into order Who makes the orphan A son and daughter The King of glory The King of glory Who rules the nations With truth and justice Shines like the sun in All of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy Worthy, oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. And this is the benediction to go out on. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for this very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. <laughs>